so I thought, of course, of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but I'm not sure if I could come down with this. So it, I could summarize it to one thing. It's money. So this might be interesting to you. The P is for the Prototype Fund, and it's about funding open source projects. Um, let's start with, you have to be German citizen. That's the, but it's a nice place to live. <laughs> you can choose. <laughs> You're out, yes. <laughs> Uh, you can be from any nation, and um, I was able to 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 won the second round of uh, prototype funding, which at that time still got only thirty thousand. And now, um, b because and that's quite funny, they there's a group of six girls or lady young ladies, which are, I believe, or maybe, but um, they are they are handling it. That's what their idea, and they are with the government of um, uh, research. They they're getting the money from them. But they are in between there, and there's very, just you fill in one formula with your idea, open source, how itself, uh, how the idea sells everyone, and it's it goes very easily through. And within the fifty thousand, there's like two and a half for consulting for you for coaching. But um, yes, even the thirty thousand was great. I was planning to be here with a friend of mine, but he started to um, do a phishing app, and so. <laughs> Uh, I had to do it alone, and not so far as I wanted to go. So, uh, take a look at it, Protofan D. It's 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 worth to to jump into it. And the second thing is called this is the good news. Um, it's not a bad news, but ODF is about the standard, the file format. And uh, to me, I think open source is not enough. Open source sys different software have to be interoperable, have to communicate with another. Uh, Otherwise, there's still the chance of a lock-in. And um, although standards are very slow, the, uh, the ISO, the process of ISO has been made for material, for pages that never change, and software needs evolution, right? Uh, there's a contrary contradiction here. But uh, you have to keep in mind that the ODF, the blueprint of the ODF application flight, LibreOffice, is very, very important. So, um, but I hear it often, oh, standards, I don't like them. I like open source, that's sufficient. No, I don't think so. And I'm, I'm pretty much sure that the user needs a freedom to choice, freedom of choice to, to switch between ODF uh, applications. So, with no further ado, some history of the um, incubating project. I believe it was 2005, I must admit I've just um, did a good guess, when at Sun Microsystems um, we came together, we had the Star Office at that time, maybe even Open Office, but um, we thought about. Uh, bringing all these software solutions that we made for the server, these tiny things. Oh, I just want to unzip the XML package with the XML and add something. And um, we, we had, most of us have something in Java, and we put it all together in one place. And because it was opportune at this time, we, um, we made it open source as well. And IBM had the same code fragments, so we came together. And um, it was then later being used and pushed by... Um, being used at the back end of a web server, web office, sorry, web office, right? You have a browser, an HTML doc, uh, a document that you're editing, and basically it's been ODF in the, in the server. It's being uh, sent back and unzipped and transformed to HTML back and forth. Oops. So um, how do you know anything about uh, the toolkit? You might have used it before without knowing. Uh, recently it's been um, LibreOffice sponsored the, the validator, the website for the validator. And uh, where you can, um, we have a front end, it's a JSP, it's running out of the box, you just get a WAR file uh, from the project, um, and you can use it as a standalone version as well. And this is basically the, the main modules of the, of the project. Um, at the top is a generator, which is for me the most interesting part, because it's generating uh, the source code from the schema, right? And the basic idea, what I, one of the principles I learned from software development is um, the more you generate, the better it is, right? Uh, otherwise, you have to do the work over and over again or get a mistake. It's, it's, it's a horrible lot of work. And ODF DOM, uh, the DOM gives us, indices, uh, gives a sign about it's um, like in, in the browser, HTML DOM, every element has its own object. The advantage is that you will 
from the start on, you have no information loss. You load the full document into the DOM, you can edit it, adjust it, and save it back. The idea on generating it is uh, the schema is quite complicated. i give more details later. So the more you generate, the, the less uh, the developer has to know about the schema and can be guided with, uh, with the, let's say, typed classes. There's even an element class for the paragraph called um, text p element. But um, the disadvantage is um, the memory is larger than, let's say, binaries or bits and, and optimization. But I think in the toolkit, in the first place, if the, um, you need to have a research, you have to improve the generation. And then later on, you can um, generate source code, not yet like in Java, maybe later in Rust, and of course, maybe in, uh, in a binary representation and going away from the DOM. Um, aside of this, using the DOM is the XLT runner, Stefan, your XLT, which, is, which enables you to run the XLT script directly on the ODF document without the need to unzip the content and the styles and so on, right? So those guys who love uh, XLT will happily be using the scripts directly on the document. The other thing we just saw before is the ODF validator. These are the both uh, important works from the ODF DOM. And the last thing that has been donated by IBM um, and no longer supported by IBM as soon they did, um, yeah, as soon they choose to, choose to, uh, to move on to something else, um, they abandon that. And then this, I make it in red because I think as well it's, um, um, yeah, it could be done better. Yes, it was a very fast work they did once. So let's take a closer look at this ODF, ODF DOM. Um, there's a package layer which is taking care of the zip, unzipping and the manifest, and totally independent. This can be used by any other uh, software as well. EPUB 1, by the way, used the same ODF uh, 1.1 packaging format. Unfortunately, they forked for no reason I am aware of. Maybe they didn't, yeah, they, we don't talk to each other. And uh, they invented their own signing encryption and uh, have their own packet format fork, which is nonsense, of course. But yeah, we didn't have dinner together. So, and the next thing on top of that is the as I said, the um, generated layer. And this generated, uh, generator oh, sorry, can be split again in two different areas. One which is totally, yes, generated, the implementation detail of the XML, and the above, we call it here the document API, is um, the way the user knows it. Like my mom would say, there's a paragraph, there's a table. They don't, uh, she don't know anything about uh, how it's been implemented in XML. And the funny thing, from the user perspective, many, oh, Office documents look the same, like DOCX or uh, ODT. They, if they load into the same office, most documents look quite the same, but the XML is totally different. So on the abstraction of the user level layer, they're very much the same. So um, this layer concept is, can be found also in the specification, which consists in the ODF 1 or 2 specification in three parts. And you've seen uh, the lower layer here, the, the part three, is the package format and which can be used by others as well, as I said. And the first one specifies the XML, and the second one is just the formula for the calc. Might be used in writer as well, but usually only for the calc. So um, there's also this separation of yeah, concern or modelization being given by these uh, three specifications. And what we have, we talked earlier in the first part, in the XML is the schema, the grammar, that tells you what is allowed. And this is quite complex. I'm not sure if you can read it here, but it's, I would say it's, it's ugly for, from a usability perspective. For me, it's ugly, ugly because um, we have about 600 XML elements and 1,300 1, XML attributes, and this is quite a lot. Some would say if you write an office with only the paragraph, it's also quite complicated than adding styles and so on. But um, embracing everything is quite impossible without um, the way of generating and making this easier to, to understand. Um, I've chosen the table here, and you see there are a lot of references and so on. I won't go into it into detail, but um, we started um, this generator, uh, 2050, I said, and in the beginning we, we simple on the first try with XSLT. Uh, Christian Lipke did some, um, XSLT, former colleague, um, I did some XLT transformation and uh, read this XML file directly to fill it into Java, which was, uh, yeah, 
quite of work and uh, quite of things he did, and only a subset, of course. And we couldn't use this, uh, oh, it's B, uh, it's not a P, binding, yes. We couldn't use the Java XML binding because the Sun standard for mapping XML to Java classes only works for W3 schema and not for the Relax and G schema. Well, the nice thing about standards, there are so many you can choose one. <laughs> so no, there's inter uh, no interoperability, as I said. Um, so instead, and that's what we are currently uh, using, um, we, we use two different open source technologies. It's a multi-schema validator from Sun, uh, which takes part, uh, take care of the parsing. You can reuse it, have to don't in, uh, invent it or write it yourself. And there's an internal model then. Um, and from this, it's, um, you f take this and fill it into templates, text files, um, where you can create anything. We create uh, HTML documentation. There's some Python, I believe, and yes, mainly Java then, it's been tested. And all the information was being, um, that's, that we wanted to use was being sucked out of this model into lists and maps. And somehow I realized that it was quite difficult. When I tried to improve this, uh, I realized I, I couldn't find these things in the list and, and it was very hard to, 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 um, uh, to expand it. And um, I thought it would be much better if we could directly take the relax and G as a graph, right? Because like every XML is a tree, basically, yes. But as soon as you got references like a style ID to a style, you got cross references within you're starting with a graph. So, and graphs, as you might know, um, with the success of the social networks um, like Facebook, where graph theory comes um, in the daily work is in the main focus, the, uh, the work, the research in this area uh, has enormously um, expanded and the algorithm to, um, to use graphs and alter them uh, much, much better. So um, what I did, and I, I reused as, as well, um, when it says, okay, I want to lo load the ReactionG into the graph database, which graph database do I use? And the nice thing is the Tinkerpop API, uh, Tinkerpop Apache, is again um, hiding the implementation detail of a graph database. That you can use every graph database, and they have a, um, a language called Gremlin, a script language, to traverse this um, graph, uh, which is then transformed to each of the um, graph database they're using. And I feel pretty safe to, to go on an interoperable level and again here, right? Um, so what I did, well, let me first, um, I put this in the notes there. Um, I've stolen this from the Chaos Computer Club um, presentation where they, they did uh, source code analysis with graph databases. And um, so I thought when they can do it with a source code, which is much more complex, I can do it with the ReactionG as, as well. Because with ReactionG, um, if I ask anyone here and ask, please tell me what is the minimal document that is possible in ODF, right? Simply go to the root and take all the mandatory elements and put them together. You will not know, basically. But this is an easy query for, for a graph database. Give me now, start here, and now give me the minimal uh, document that is, um, that's being used here. So um, I thought I need to now uh, reverse engineer the ReactionG or have a better tooling to understand it and to control it. And that was the reason why I came up with that. So I started with the multi schema. Instead of reading the ReactionG myself, I go as well on top of this, and I uh, simply dumped this um, memory model into a text file line by line, and then wrote, uh, just for fun, this Antelag grammar to, to, to as a parser, you generate a parser, you read it, and um, you map it to the GraphML, which is just simply a graph format which is quite interoperable. And with this, I could, um, I could visualize first time um, a graph. So um, are there any questions at this point? Because maybe this is quite, um, no, I'm speeding up a little bit on, on that because this is an essential uh, idea. Why I'm doing this? Because ReactionG is so big and it's one huge text file and we want to improve it and want to work on it. And like, uh, like Stefan using Clang compiler plugins to traverse to C++ source code, which is very huge, I want to use a graph database to traverse uh, this tree of ReactionG to, to, uh, to answer me questions in, a, in an automated way, right? And 
and be able to do refactorings later because otherwise it's too huge to, for manual editing. Okay? This is just, we need a, need a better tooling to, to embrace this um, complexity. All right. So what I did is, um, please, Graph Database, give me from table to table all the child elements and everything in between, all nodes in between. And there are nodes in between like choice, sequence, and so on. So you will don't you see just a picture, like a star picture. You don't see the details, right? This is the table table and all the elements around. Um, I have an Agavi Galfi viewer there. Just and the red things are the um, are the attributes, right? So do you you see there some structure? Okay, I, I will zoom a little bit in. Yes, uh, the attributes, and then we've got this here, and um, I will explain a little bit. There's a sequence, okay? A sequence of one, two. Let's mean there's an order. You have to follow, first. You have to use this, and then you have to use this. At the top, there's an element called text soft page break, and after this, you can use the table table row. Okay? This here is boilerplate at the moment, right? And and this here, uh, epsilon means nothing. So you have the choice to have nothing or this. In other words, it's. It's just meaning it's optional, okay? So the next step, and that's what I'm currently working on, is I'm, um, I'm refactoring it and improving it by uh, uh, exchanging this to optional, and whenever the, uh, this name is similar to this, I remove this as well, just to, to simplify it. Okay, I've got five minutes left, I'm going on. So what I'm trying to do now is, um, there are a few things like choice and sequence that I need to generate that's not yet in the coding. And also, when, there are, um, when there's a parent, like a style, and that has many sty uh, styles, that have many styles which have an ID, I want to have a map in there. I just want to generate it out of the box. I want to generate as much from this DOM layer as possible then, because I don't want to uh, roll it over and over again. And another thing is, um, when there's a reference, in XML said, oh, there's a reference, and there's a, there's a uh, start of a reference, and there's a stop of a reference. But in, uh, they don't say that style ID and style name, or style, yeah, but they are connected, always connected. That's missing information. So the next thing is I want to annotate and enhance um, the, the schema with additional information so I can generate more. And the last thing is, and this is the most important thing, why I'm doing this, all of this, is there are user changes which are not specified in the schema. The schema says, oh, you can put anything. As long as it's valid, it's fine. But the users among us are just um, doing the same thing in all offices. We are adding tables, adding paragraphs, adding characters. And this is the high document earlier, see, the, the high API, the user API, where I need to implement it um, for collaboration because if we collaborate it, we, the, long, the single document, uh, this is the only way we have it, is no longer possible. It's, it's broken. We cannot merge. If, you go, uh, if I give you documents, give it back, uh, it cannot merge it. It's like we need changes. Like in a Git software commit, I want to ask you, what have you changed? Give me your changes, right? So um, I want to have user changes on the high-level thing, and I want to be able to answer this question. So my work on the prototype thing was... Oh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, I forgot the site. <laughs> so uh, this is just um, the, the user changes is an implicit standard, but it's not being documented anyway. It's in our mind, but it's not written. And we have to start to write it down and have these injure, delete, and modify changes for all these user components we have to um, annotate in this uh, schema. So on my work on this by prototype fund is that I promise to put an ODT into the ODF toolkit, um, use it as a black box, and it's been transformed into a sequence of changes, like a cook recipe where you can say, oh, insert the first paragraph, insert hello world, do this in the second, do an hour, second, do an image, third, do a table, right? It's the high level change. It's totally equivalent. And the other thing is, it should be able to accept new changes and merge it into it, right? To, to have a proof of concept of this and to see uh, how it's work. And the new thing is here, I want to generate as much as possible to avoid redundancy. So, um, the user changes are de facto not a standard yet, right? So we are in need of enhance the real XNG to, to generate it, right? And otherwise, um, there's, because it's deterministic, why should I write it by hand if it's for all applications the same thing? It's mu much better to have a, uh, to have a, a way to, to annotate it. And how we do it? That's easy. 
but I'm unfortunately running out of time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any questions? Thank you, first. Okay. Yes, please. So I'm a bit curious about why choosing to go to the graph rather than just... Uh, because I, I clearly uh, hear you saying sequence is important, and then why not stay in the uh, XML tree model with X query instead of going to... Yes, good question. So the sequence, by the way, is just um, if you and I are working on the same document, we again have branches and we are again in a, in a graph, right? Like in the Git model. Uh, but um, the graph is because it's the natural 